Uh, hi, I'm Fritz Holtznagel. I'm a writer uh, in the Edwards team, proud Edwards team. I see there are some other Edwards writers right down here. And uh, welcome to another presentation of the uh, Authors at Google program. Uh, it's a real pleasure to introduce our guest today. He's been called the Seabiscuit of Geekdom. <laughs> The Joe DiMaggio Game Show contestants and uh, Seattle Weekly uh, even called him a walking, talking Google. <laughs> and Time Magazine uh, just last week coined a new term, especially for him, celebra nerd. <laughs> <laughs> uh, in 2004, he won 74 straight episodes of the game show Jeopardy. Uh, in the course of that run, he tallied 2,693 correct responses to questions from Alec Trebek. He hit 160 daily doubles and answered 133 of them correctly for a batting average of 83%. And uh, amazingly, 65 out of his 74 wins were locks. He was so far ahead that he couldn't be beat in final jeopardy. His total winnings over those 75 games were just over $2.5 million, an average of about $34,000 a game. Since then, he's created his own board game. He's written a monthly column for Mental Floss magazine. He's done commercials for FedEx and Allstate. He signed on as a spokesman for Microsoft's Encarta. Thank you. Thanks. That's, thanks for mentioning that. That's, that's great. And uh, he also has been working with Comedy Central to develop a game show of his own. I want to ask you about that later. He's appeared on David Letterman, The Colbert Report, The Today Show, Nightline, and Regis and Kathy Lee. And for the next hour, he's here with us at Google. His new book is titled Brainiac, Adventures in the Curious, Competitive, Compulsive World of Trivia Buffs. <laughs> it's published by Random House. It was released last week, and it's terrific. He also has a great blog, if you're online right now, at ken-jennings.com. And he'll be appearing tonight at Book Passage in San Francisco. Please give a googly welcome to Ken Jennings. Thank you. Thank you. Happy to be here. Thank you. You guys can hear me? Is this working? Yeah. Great. And books went out already? Is that right? Uh, yeah. Great. Uh, we're going to chat a little bit here, and, uh, and then we'll take questions from the audience for the second half of the show. Uh, let's start with Celebrity Nerd. In your, in your tongue-in-cheek, uh, in your blog, you've got a tongue-in-cheek campaign going uh, to get Celebrity Nerd more prominent in Google. Uh, this is your chance. You're at the source. Do you want to like make a pitch for that? That's the main reason I'm here today, is to help out the page rank of any page Using the word celebrity nerd, I plead with you. <laughs> Think of all the people out there right now saying celebrity nerd and wasting those two letters, the T and the Y. If only the word celebrity nerd would catch on. Think of the efficiency this country would gain. Thank you and good night. <laughs> let's, uh, let's dish the dirt on Regis for a minute. <laughs> uh, You've never actually seen Jeopardy, have you? Is it? <laughs> no, actually, I. Jeopardy. Uh, is it true you were on Regis and Kathy Lee and you told Regis that Jeopardy was a man's game unlike Who Wants to Be a Millionaire? I was using, I was using, <laughs> I was using, I was using, it sounds a bit chauvinist, I was using man as a, as a shorthand for, you know, it's a real adults game, you know, uh, it's, a, it's a person's game. I guess I don't know the PC way to say that. Did, but he, yeah. did he rise to the challenge? Did he defend Who Wants to Be a Millionaire at all? Uh, actually, he did not. But I think the point stands. I mean, you can win a million dollars on Millionaire for what, 15 questions? I, I don't know the math. But uh, I mean, 15 questions, that's not even going to win you one game on Jeopardy. But bigger money. Tell us about the book. Tell us about the book a little bit. If you would just give us the story of the backstory on, on how it got started and, and what it's all about. Uh, Brainiac is not just a behind the curtain look at Jeopardy or the nerd who was on Jeopardy for six months, although there is, there is plenty of that. I, I don't mind talking about myself. But. Uh, <laughs> It's more a look at American trivia. You know, when I was a kid, I was this insane trivia buff. I don't know. Maybe there's people in this room who had the same weird trivia childhood because many of the people I interviewed in the book had identical childhoods to mine where, you know, you wouldn't play outside if you could be inside reading the baseball encyclopedia or Leonard Malton's movie guide or, or old TV guide listings or, or whatever, you know. As far back as I can remember, I've just been obsessed with information. Uh, and, um, you know, this is the book I would have wanted to read. You know, where does trivia come from? What, why are our brains so interested in knowing weird facts and regurgitating weird questions about said facts? You know, I, I, didn't, I realized I was a poster boy for trivia and didn't know any of the stuff I should know about, about trivia as a cultural phenomenon. And so that's sort of the story of the book. Traveling the country, meeting trivia nerds of all kinds, trying to figure out what makes them tick, seeing their, 
you know, obsessive subcultures in action. It was a lot of fun. You were a software engineer yourself, and I'm curious if while you were traveling the country, uh, you noticed that there is a correlation between computer geeks and trivia geeks, because that's sort of the, uh, the rep that, the, the rep that people have, trivia people have is that there's a high percentage of computer geeks. Do you think that's true? I think that's true. I think it's harder to get on Jeopardy if you're, a, if you're a, in, in the computer business, um, just because that's who they have trying out, you know. Um, there's certainly different, uh, you know, subcultures in the hierarchy of geekdom. And I know it's, you know, the Venn diagram, I don't know how it looks between trivia and uh, computer programmers, because, you know, there's a whole different kind of math nerd thing going on among computer programmers that doesn't really come up on game shows. So, it's, it's, you know, it's not a perfect thing, but yeah, I think you're right. That's interesting. Um, tell me about, tell me about your own uh, computer background. When did you get interested in computers? And, and you actually were working as a software engineer, right, when you were on the show? That's right. Uh, software engineer for the Salt Lake City, Utah. I was, uh, I was actually an English major in college until it was helpfully pointed out to me that, like, no English major has ever supported his family in the history of the world. <laughs> I, I, I know you're a tech writer, and I took some technical writing classes, too. <laughs> I was a history major, then, <laughs> Is that so that's right? a lot better. Yeah, it's, you know, it's like, what's the difference between a pepperoni pizza and an English major? You know, at least the pepperoni pizza can feed a family of four. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> and, and so, about that, actually. at that point, you know, at that point, I, I became a double major in computer science, um, uh, and uh, worked for an internet startup with some friends from high school. When they stopped, um, you know, doing the little things that matter, like paying their employees, yeah, I, sure. I switched over to a healthcare staffing company right around the time the bubble popped, uh, and, and really enjoyed my job. But I, frankly, I'm not much of a developer. Like I, I'm a yeah. pretty, I'm a pretty lousy computer programmer. So you know, it turns out that the same neurons that uh, make for trivia greatness do not necessarily make for the most elegant code. I guess. You talk a little bit in the book about how you were trying to juggle that job in, in uh, Jeopardy when you were on the show, and I wonder if you would just talk a little bit about that, about how you kept your appearance as a secret for what I guess was like six months or right, several months right. while you were pretending to be sick or pretending to be <laughs> out like two days out of every week, right? right? Two things to set up the story. Jeopardy tapes, uh, as you know, by the way, uh, Fritz here is a five-day Jeopardy champion himself, a Tournament of Champions champion, in fact. That's right. Uh, right here? As he, and so as he knows, but many of you may not, Jeopardy actually tapes five shows a day, you know, a whole week's worth of shows in a single afternoon. You and Alex pretend, you know, change your ties and pretend that that means it's a whole new show. Uh, it's a whole new day. And, um, and also those shows are taped four months in advance. So I had won about 50 shows before any of them had aired. So I'm flying back down from my office in Salt Lake City to L.A. Uh, two or three times a month, winning 10 Jeopardy games and some six-figure amount of money. And then coming back home, unable to tell anyone, because I've signed some ironclad uh, confidentiality contract saying that I won't reveal if I've won or lost. We don't have those here. Oh, of course not. <laughs> There's something called a non-disclosure. You've probably never seen one. And uh, so, yeah, my parents didn't know. You know, my parents would call me on my cell phone. I'm driving down the San Diego freeway trying to get to Jeopardy, and I'm pretending I'm at work, you know. <laughs> Me meanwhile, at work, my boss is telling people that, oh, Ken's home painting his basement or something. Uh, <laughs> and these are obviously not Google Caliber engineers, because nobody ever figured out a thing. You know, nobody ever guessed that, uh, that I was, you know, uh, hiding some million-dollar secret. And I started, in the book, I, I say I started to feel like Clark Kent, you know, working at his... Working at his, his dull office job and then, you know, flying out the, the broom closet window every, you know, a couple times a week to have this glamorous <laughs> secret identity. And then he comes back to work and he can't say a thing. Like, oh, Superman was here, Lois? Oh, wow, that's, you know. <laughs> I, I must have missed it, you know. Oh, man. Uh, and uh, you got on the show by taking a big road trip, road trip down there with your buddy from, from uh, from Salt Lake City. Has he, has he made it on the show yet? No, we both passed the test, but he did not, uh, he has not yet made it on the show. I think he has to try out again, but now that the tryouts are online, he does want to audition again. Good. Tell me a little bit, I'm, I'm curious about, because you've been traveling for the last year, I'm kind of curious about um, regional trivia. And uh, it used to be that uh, there would be different foods. You would go to the South and you'd get collard greens or whatever, and uh, you'd hear an accent. You go to New England, you'd hear a New England accent. Do you have any uh, experience of like regional trivia? Did you get asked about uh, presidents in Virginia, or uh, <laughs> you go to the Northwest? Do they ask you about the weather, or is there any kind of? Is it like trivia, like pan pan international now? Uh, there actually is some. Uh, I don't know about regional differences. I mean, I do. I you know, trivia is sort of a regional thing where, for example, Minnesota, Wisconsin area, they they love doing these weekend long radio trivia contests where you know. People, you know, I, I go to this little town called Stevens Point, Wisconsin. It's a town of like 20,000-something people. 
12,000 people every year play in this radio trivia contest for 54 hours straight. You know, they, they don't sleep for this weekend. They just answer trivia questions on the radio. And they spend all year prepping for this by taking notes on every sitcom they watch and, and so forth. Um, so that, you know, there are trivia phenomenons like that that are local. As far as the content of the trivia, uh, I have been finding out recently, this is not in the books, I have been found, finding out recently about the world of international trivia. Like, uh, you know, quizzing is very big in Britain. They still have the academic quiz shows where, you know, where we just have deal or no deal, you know. They, <laughs> they've got like, uh, you know, PhD uh, candidates answering questions about rocket science or whatever. Um, but it's not just Britain, I, you know, there's, quizzing's very big in Belgium, apparently. There, in Sri Lanka, in Croatia, apparently. Quizzing is this worldwide phenomenon, and so making the, the questions culturally neutral is sort of an issue. Quizzing in the form we know it here, of, of uh, getting a book or a magazine article, or like people just sitting around, or, you know, <laughs> quizzing each other in pubs, or? There's, pub quiz is a huge part of it. Often there's like weekend events where, um, you know, sort of like how Google sponsors like the international puzzle team, and there's a trivia team that plays here once a year or something. Something like that, where companies will send their best quizzing team to to face off against other local companies for charity or whatever. It's a cultural thing that we don't really have here very often. I've heard that the uh, big money aspect is not really the same in Europe, too, that you like uh, going to a game show there and you win big and it's uh, a refrigerator or, uh, you, know, a, 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 you know, a wardrobe or something like that. It's not like a million dollars. Is that right. true? Anything well, about that? Except for who wants to be a millionaire, which, which they invented. Oh, right. Yeah, I, I don't think there really is the big money game show over there. You know, they're answering questions that are much harder than anything Alex Trebek has ever had to say. And yeah, you're right. They're you know they're getting a toaster oven or something. <laughs> what's a uh, what's a what was a common interaction for you, or what is a common interaction for you on the street these days? Uh, people recognize you. Do they quiz you? Do they uh, assault you? Do they uh, <laughs> I do. I assault me? Yeah. <laughs> Jeopardy sucks, and I'm taking it out on you, <laughs> Jennings. Uh, people are usually very nice. Like even when I was still on Jeopardy, there wasn't really much backlash. Like you're ruining Jeopardy. My grandma hates you. You know, I didn't I didn't get a whole lot of that. Um, I do get recognized still all the time in weird places. I've been recognized at the top of the Eiffel Tower. Huh. I, was, uh, I was summoned by PA to the bridge of the Staten Island Ferry once. And it, tur it turned out <laughs> they just wanted to shake my hand, but I was like, uh. I mean, the guy okay. actually came on, Ken Jennings, please come. Yeah, in. <laughs> it's like you, your, your wife is waiting for you at the front refreshment stand. And my wife's like standing right there. <laughs> she's, she's like, what are you not telling me? You know? um, many people do ask a very hard trivia question like, Apparently, they carry around a very hard trivia question just in case they meet Ken Jennings, you know. Oh, and, yeah. And here you go. And people often don't have a good idea of what is answerable trivia versus what is some thing I remember because I'm a weirdo, you know, uh, which, which is a distinction I try to make in the book. But, you know, people will, uh, you know, some guy, I spoke at my mom's elementary school. She's a librarian. And I spoke, you know, I told the kids that reading is good. And afterwards, some teacher comes up to me and he's like, okay, what's the name of George Reeves' apartment building on the old Superman TV show? And I was like, oh, I don't know. That's a good one. He's like, of course you don't. It was in only one episode. <laughs> <laughs> and I was like, good, good, good for you. Well, yeah, well, well, well done. That'll take you far, you know? Do you have a catchphrase for that? Like, you got me, or? I, I do typically. Uh, you're a loser? <laughs> <laughs> I do typically try to get it wrong. You know, it's, it's less pressure on me. It's more fun for them. Everybody mm -hmm. wins, you know? <laughs> Um, you know, we were talking a little earlier about uh, trivia on the internet. Right. And you do talk about it in the book. I wonder, uh, I guess if you would uh, sort of recap what you talk about in the book about how internet has affected trivia, and then, uh, and then I'll follow up. I have a couple questions about okay. that for you. There's sort of a few avenues in which the internet, and Google in particular, I, now that I'm here at Google, I don't have to say Google and other search engines, you know, as if, <laughs> as if people still use other search engines, uh, uh, you know, have affected the way trivia works. Um, a lot of it is just the temptation to cheat, you know? Like, uh, if you're playing some trivia game on the internet, the answer is probably about eight or 10 keystrokes away, you know? Thanks to the miracle of Google. And so, uh, you know, I run a weekly trivia quiz on my website, and it's sort of some honor system, you know? No Googling. If you're gonna Google, don't bother sending in your answers, because, you know, big deal. My, my Labrador Retriever could get seven if he had Google, you know? But, um, but people still Google, you know? It's just very tempting. And so a lot of, tri a lot of trivia uh, you know, fora have had to change their rules to allow for that. Like in Stevens Point, Wisconsin, where people are playing trivia on the radio and calling in answers, um, you know, before they would have to keep file cabinets full of notes, you know, with the credits of every movie ever made and every session musician on every rock song ever played. You know, they these people would have card catalogs in their basements. And now, you know, these people still have card catalogs, but it's like a butter churn. You know, it's obsolete because 
every team in town now has access to the, you know, the biggest information library ever put together because it's just one Google search away. And so the contest tries to make the questions you know, Google proof, which typically means they're either so boring you don't care or they're, you know, they're visual. What color is the t-shirt of the guy in, you know, and even that is probably so boring you don't <laughs> care. So, so that, that, you know, that sort of hurt their contest, I think. You know, people look nostalgically on some pre-Google era, which mm -hmm. I think is very interesting. How, how is it? We've never heard about that. I never heard about that contest until I read about it in your book, and it sounds like such a giant deal. I'm, I'm surprised I think it hasn't ever like. These people don't get out much, probably, so you probably haven't <laughs> met them. I, no, it's very, it's very localized. Like every college town in Wisconsin has this small, you know, year-long, you know, uh, annual trivia day. But yeah, I had never heard of it either. It's funny. Hmm. How'd you find out about it? Uh, I know a couple people. There is sort of a trivia subculture. When you get to the highest levels, the people who you know, win on Jeopardy are also the people dominating the college quiz bowl circuit in their day. Mm -hmm. And they're also the people winning uh, NTN in their local bar. You know, it is sort of the same, you know, very high echelon of uh, know-it-all trivia nerd. And uh, a few of these people that I knew from quiz bowl, you know, knew somebody who knew somebody who played in the Stevens Point thing. Right. I I'm interested in the, in the Google, the Google angle because, uh, well, I work here. I'm interested in information. but. Um, uh, one of the things I feel like I've noticed over the last few years is that I just don't, uh, that I go to the internet immediately to look stuff up. I don't try and reason something out. If somebody asked me who, was, who won the Academy Award in 1972 for something, I don't really try and think through what movies were in 72 and who was popular then and all that stuff. Why bother, right? Why bother? And uh, so uh, my question, I guess, is, uh, is, you know, is that part of my m brain muscle weakening and is the internet sort of picking up the slack for me there? And I, I guess... I mean, the question is, is, is Google making me dumber? Uh, <laughs> is there some way in which Google is sort of becoming our common, uh, at least in trivia, trivia brain or sort of brain for minutia? Any thoughts about that? I thought about that a lot, you know, because, I mean, anyone with a cell phone has noticed this phenomenon. You probably used to know hundreds of people's cell phone numbers if you're of a certain age, if you're, you know, if you're older than uh, 18, say. And now, I don't know, whose phone numbers do you know? I don't know my parents' phone number, you know? I, I, know, it's, uh, I know which hotkey it is. And I think Google's sort of the same way, except there's a hotkey for every single fact ever discovered in the history of human learning. Um, uh, it used to be that, you know, if you wanted to remember something like that, you'd be bugging all your coworkers for, for weeks. Oh, okay, did you see Murphy Brown last night? Okay, I've seen that guy somewhere before. You know, do you remember the guy with the bald guy who, but, or, if, you know, if you can't remember now as an clear, extension, you're bugging everybody for weeks, or, you know, what movie is I kind of think of it like, um, or, we don't now have everything to do long, is full text do long division you know? anymore because there's always right. a calculator handy in the same way maybe I, you know, we're not doing trivia. I think I've heard, I've heard teachers say that, right? Kids are getting yeah. worse at arithmetic because, you know, who the hell cares? Just, I, you know, I got a calculator. <laughs> Why do I need to know long division? Is that affecting, uh, I mean, is trivia getting less popular, do you think? Is there any like, evidence that like, trivia is uh, winding down because uh, nobody has to remember that stuff anymore? Trivia tends to be cyclical, so it's sort of hard to say. I mean, uh, like, when would you say trivia was popular? If I asked you when trivia was popular, when was trivia popular? 50s because of the quiz show scandal. Like, the 80s because of Trivial Pursuit. Uh, you know, 2000, Who Wants to Be a Millionaire is insanely popular. A lot of, you know, a lot of people real, don't realize it goes further back than that. Like, in, the, in 1927, there was some huge jazz age trivia boom where everybody was buying these, uh, you know, best-selling trivia quiz books at the height of the, the crossword puzzle craze. So trivia tends to come and go. So it's hard to say if, you know, if trivia is in a fallow period now, you know, who knows if it's going to come back. Um, I think it, maybe trivia won't come back as a fad just because, because of uh, Google, because of the information age we live in. We're, we're all saturated with information. You know? um, if you were a fan of some movie 50 years ago, good luck finding out great behind the scenes trivia about that movie. But now, like every movie you buy, even the crappy ones, you know, if I'm going to rent Chill Factor with Cuba Gooding Jr., there's going to be some three hours of of awesome Are you behind the scenes. On Cuba uh, Gooding Jr. I'm Chill Factor is pretty terrible. My man, Cuba Gooding Jr. Uh, Chill Factor is pretty terrible, even if you're a, a Cuba <laughs> Gooding fan. But there's going to be three hours of uh, ins you know insanely detailed behind the scenes minutia about even the worst movies now. You know, um, so everybody can be a trivia nerd now. And like, is it like The Incredibles? If everybody's a trivia nerd, then nobody is. I, I don't know. So it sounds like maybe trivia is actually, we're like in the golden age. It's like booming rather than... Right, it permeates everything now instead of being some, um, you know, well, that's kind of pet rock-like fad. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, let's talk about, if you don't mind talking about your personal celebrity a little bit, I, I'm sort of curious, in the, in the book you tell a funny anecdote about your son stops calling you daddy and starts calling you something else. And uh, I wonder if you can just talk about what, what it's, this whole thing has been like through his eyes. Uh, how he sees it and, and you know, 
just how what that's like to have a kid when you're uh, <laughs> in a TV celebrity. Right, right. He stopped calling me daddy and started calling me Ken Jennings because <laughs> because that's what they hear on that's what he heard, he heard you know he heard the announcer say at the open of every Jeopardy, and I think he still sort of has that. Like when I was on TV last week uh, flogging the book, um, you know people you know he. You know, he would settle down to watch me on TV, and he would, you know, he'd be talking to his teddy bear. This is what my wife said, and he'd be like, "We're going to watch Ken Jennings on TV right now," you know. <laughs> so he he sort of dissociated it, I guess, like it's, you know, Daddy's the one who sends me to bed if I don't eat my cottage cheese or whatever. But Ken Jennings is is on He's TV. He's a great guy. And he, exactly, and he, uh, you know, and I was on Sesame Street, so I'm hanging out with Grover. And he, you know, Dylan's totally underwhelmed because you know, he, you know he's a year and a half. He probably thinks everybody gets to hang out with Grover. You know, like, oh yeah, Dad's talking with Grover. I know Dad. I know Grover. Why shouldn't they hang out? You know, <laughs> like, he, like so. I think he was a bit. I think he was a bit young to miss you know, how cool it was. So of course I'll embarrass him as he grows up. You know, every first date he ever goes on, I'll, I'll whip out the Jeopardy slides and uh, you yeah, know, that'll be good. He'll get sick of hearing about you know. Oh, Dad's talking about Jeopardy again. I know. didn't know you were on Sesame Street. That's awesome. Yeah, Grover. I got what did to, you do? How did I do? No, what did you do? Oh. Yeah, how did you do? <laughs> I won 74 straight <laughs> Sesame Streets. <laughs> um, Grover and I uh, stressed the value of eating a lot of fresh fruit. <laughs> it's, it's apparently something Grover feels deeply about. Me and Grover and a talking pineapple. <laughs> I, uh, it was a lot of fun. Did, but, did you get to ask for fresh fruit, or did they just give you fresh fruit as your topic? Th that's sort of what they had. They're doing some kids are too fat thing. So uh, <laughs> if, you, if you watch Sesame Street now, like Cookie Monster's eating like you know uh, soy cookies or something <laughs> now. Uh, but it's cool. Like you get to hang. Like you get to go to Mr. Hooper's store and see all the little funny labels on the wall, and you, you can. If you've got very narrow shoulders, you can get an Oscar the Grouch's ca uh, can, and uh, awesome. it, it was fun. It was like childhood flashback. In, in New York City? They film it in New York City? Yeah, it's in oh. Queens. Wow, that's awesome. What a great story. So is your son, uh, I guess I have to ask, is he a trivia buff? Is he, has he got the gene? I think he might have the gene. Like, trivia is often, you know, absorption, and maybe he's too young to have absorbed much. You know, he's not, you know, if the, if the, if the trivial pursuit question is about Watergate, he's not, like, you know, buzzing in there. He, he's only three. <laughs> but... Uh, <laughs> He seems to have the sort of the, the early signs. Like I think, uh, I think there's a, a component of memory to it. He seems to have a very good memory. Like you read him a, a Curious George book for bedtime one night. The, the next night he can pretty much read it back to you, and it's sort of creepy, but like it, it's definitely a sign of, of trivia. What about ad jingles? Yeah, like he's really good at remembering songs. Like he doesn't watch a whole lot of TV, but like the Wiggles. I don't know. Do you guys know this? Australian guys wear jumpsuits or something. He, uh, you know, he can sing back any Wiggle song he's ever heard. Um, so he seems to have the memory for it. You know, whether he'll have the interest, hard to say. But yeah, maybe he'll be breaking my Jeopardy record someday. I don't, I don't know. <laughs> um, tell us about uh, the Comedy Central game show. I know that it sounds like that's on hold right now. But you were developing a game show with them. Yeah. And uh, I'm real curious just to hear about what that process is like and what maybe you learned about either about television or about uh, game shows in general, about you know, what you have to do or what the imperatives are. And, and or, or about myself. Or about yourself, yes. What did you learn in your heart uh, <laughs> um, about that stuff? And, and is there any chance we might see it uh, sometime soon? Yeah, right after Jeopardy, I was, uh, there was some interest in a lot of people in having some Ken Jennings game show. And I was working with Michael Davies. He's like the British guy who, brought, who wants to be a millionaire to the States. Um, and we were, we were sort of working on developing some, uh, you know, some Win Ben Stein's Money-like game show. Except, instead of Ben Stein, here's the twist. It's me, you know? <laughs> it's like a Gentile win Ben Stein's money or something. <laughs> uh, and, um, and, you know, it was, real, it was sort of a funny show. I think uh, Ken Jennings versus the rest of the world was the gimmick, was the title. And the gimmick was, you know, you find five people of a certain demographic. It's Ken against barbers, or it's Ken against uh, great-grandmothers, or, uh, you know, uh, people who ate the black-eyed peas, or crossword puzzle fans, or... You know, you pick some demographic and have me face off against them. And the show was very funny, and we were developing it for Comedy Central, and they really liked it. The story I heard was that um, they thought they were in the market for a half-hour game show to pair with The Daily Show. And then Stephen Colbert's show was a big hit, and, like, I'm a huge fan of the show, so I can't really complain. Like, I, I was watching it, too. I'm definitely part of the problem. Uh, and so they were no longer in the market for a game show. So we're sort of pitching it around to see if anybody else wants it. It's a funny show, and, and I would love for it to see air. And I, I've loved game shows ever since I was a kid, so... 
I mean, there's a story of Brainiac of me not wanting to go to school when I was five years old, not wanting to start kindergarten, because I'd, I'd miss Family Feud, you know? <laughs> uh, I, I wouldn't be able to see Pyramid and Password uh, every day anymore. Um, so I would love to see, uh, you know, the game, sh the game show take off again. But You say, uh, didn't you say you're, uh, you were excited when you had a third uh, sister because I gave you five in the family for Family Feud? Exactly. Right? When, my, when my sister was born, I was like, that's five of us, you know. Uh, I get to meet Richard <laughs> Dawson now. <laughs> this is going to be awesome. Did you work any feud-like elements into, the, into your own uh, show? Are you trying to work? Is, it like, uh, is there a family, family component or anything I guess like there that? sort of is. It's five cont I didn't think of this. It's five contestants with something in common. Holy cow. Like yeah, if you start, <laughs> if you start dressing, my ass, if you start dressing like Richard Dawson, that's you, got the, you should worry the, about it. The light brown suit and the vest and everything. <laughs> um, and you were just on the Colbert Report. You mentioned the Colbert Report. You were just on it last week. Uh, I'm curious about that too. Uh, you know, what do they tell you beforehand? Do you do you meet him? Is he crazy? Uh, <laughs> you got you guys know the Colbert Report. It's a, you know it's a. For those who don't know it, it's a fake news show and it's a fake news pundit show. So he's sort of a, a blowhard and an idiot. You know. And uh, the pre-interview for the show is very funny, because normally a TV pre-interview would be like, OK, we want to ask you about Jeopardy. What's Alex like? And what did you do with the money? You know, it's, uh, you know, it's the same five questions over and over. But the Colbert pre-interview, um, they're like, OK, you know he's just playing a character. He's going to be pretending to be an idiot, right? <laughs> that, that's like the main thing. And then the second thing is, don't be funny. People come on, try to be funny. And it's just death. Pretty much, pretty much, just sit, sit there and let him be funny. He'll use you as a prop. It'll be great, you know. <laughs> <laughs> That's sort of the substance of the interview. Oh, and don't crack up. They're like, don't crack up. Uh, when people break character, it sort of ruins the show. So it's very, you know, it's very high pressure. It's like an acting gig. Uh, and I, I, if you saw the show, I cracked up repeatedly because I, I think he's very funny, and I'm a huge fan of the show. Um, but he's a lot of fun. You know, he'll come out and hang out with you backstage and beforehand, and uh, he's a cool guy. I had a good time. Did you succeed in not being funny? I think I was pretty unfunny. Anybody see it? <laughs> I, I tried to be not funny, so I hope I achieved that goal. I, I, at one point, he, he asked me something about being a Poindexter, and I was trying to come up with whatever the noun form of uh, Poindexter would be, Poindexter toot or Poindexter hood or whatever. And he had the joke. He was like, I believe it's Poindexterity. <laughs> so, uh, so now we know the, the, you know, the, the condition of being a Poindexter is Poindexterity. Uh, and I have a... a I know that uh, from reading your blog and, and from personal experience that people always ask what Alex Trebek is really like. Uh, so I thought what I'd like to, what I'm sort of curious about to hear from you is uh, if people tell you what they think of, of Alex Trebek. And, That's a good question. And if, what do they say? Is there like, are there like some common things they either like praise or complain about? Alex Trebek is apparently some great uh, cultural Rorschach test or something, you know? <laughs> like what you think about Alex Trebek apparently reveals who you are. This, this nice Canadian man. I mean, because some, uh, you know, some people just hate him with the white hot passion of a thousand suns. You know, they'll, they'll, you know, they'll ask me what Trebek is like, and it's clear that the, the, the subtext is like, he's a jerk, right? I mean, <laughs> he's an a-hole, right? Because like, I can tell. He's totally smug, and he pretends to know all the answers. And I don't know what he thinks he's doing with those accents he does. But, uh, <laughs> but yeah, yeah. oh, no, you know, no, I'm, I'm sorry. It's, uh, there, yeah. it's, it's Azerbaijan. I'm sorry. You know, he pretends to know the answer all the time. And, but, I'm, but many people, on the other hand, are you, you know, huge fans. I put up a joke blog post about a month ago you know, suggesting things that Jeopardy could do to, to liven up their format. And it was just a joke. But um, a couple of the quotes got pulled out of context and got run in like, the tabloid, you know, the New York Post, to make it look like I was bashing Jeopardy. And I got you know, more angry, all caps, emails from AOL addresses. <laughs> Than you would believe, you know? Like, uh, everyone over 70 in America felt they had to send me some angry email, you know? Because to people of a certain age, Alex is like, you know, he's like James Bond, you know? He's like a, a sex symbol or something. <laughs> so don't mess with Alex. In person, he's a very nice guy. He's, uh, you know, he's, he's not as stern and as dignified as he appears on the show. He's looser, he cracks jokes, he'll, he'll do little bits of accents and soft shoe and, you know, song and dance, which you wouldn't expect. I think that's the lot of uh, my questions. How would, how would you like to uh, read a few pages from the book? And uh, then we'll take questions from the crowd. Okay, I was trying to read, I was trying to find an excerpt that was sort of Google-centric. And uh, that actually covers something I already, <laughs> I already sort of addressed. So this is, this is going to be great, great TV. But, um, just talking about how Google has changed the, uh, the, tri the, the yearly radio trivia contest in Stevens Point, Wisconsin, since people can now look up the answers. So here's just a little excerpt from the book about the contest. Well, I don't know. Maybe I should just read about the contest in general, since we sort of already talked about Google. Are you guys going to be OK if I don't mention Google so much? 
<laughs> um, let's do this. There is no shortage of players willing to take this daunting 54-hour challenge. In a town of under 25,000 folks, enrollment for the contest hovers at a remarkable 12,000 year after year. And that's just the people officially registered. You can't quite say that half the town takes part, because many contest regulars are former residents or out-of-towners who make a yearly pilgrimage. But even so, there's no way around it. This is a town that goes radio gaga for its radio trivia. The prize for their efforts? Well, there really isn't one. The top 10 teams each get a little trophy, and that's it. I drove into Stevens Point in a rented Nissan Altima right before the parade start a few hours earlier. I'd wanted to rent a compact, but the larger Altima is a concession to the long legs of Earl Cahill. He's my six foot nine college roommate who tried out for Jeopardy with me. Who's decided to come with me to check out the contest? Are you going to register to play, I ask him? No, I just want to see what it looks like when a whole city goes trivia crazy. Would you look at that? We're driving down Division Street, the commercial strip that runs through the center of Stevens Point. It's completely familiar in its commercialized anonymity. We can see these same convenience stores, muffler shops, and Burger Kings anywhere in America. But here there's one difference. Every single signboard on the street is trivia themed. Welcome trivia players. Trivia 36, keep on trucking. Trivia special, Doritos 159. <laughs> Earl and I stop at Taco Bell for a late lunch. And even though the place is set to be gutted and remodeled in less than a week, they're hawking trivia too. Closing Monday for demolition. Welcome trivia fans. <laughs> Stevens Point is a small town, says contest organizer Jim Oliver, but it really kicks it up for trivia weekend. Trivia has put Stevens Point on the map nationally, garnering mentions on CNN and national newspapers in Leno and Letterman monologues. The contest was even the subject of a Jeopardy clue once, though all three contestants were stumped on the correct response. And trivia has, cha has shaped the town as well. As recently as the late 70s, the old style phone circuits in the Stevens Point Exchange meant that only 72, co uh, excuse me, 72 callers could be connected by phone at any given time. Most of the year, this wasn't a problem. During trivia weekend, though, hundreds of callers might be trying to call in answers to the radio station at once. You could go 10 minutes without getting a dial tone, recalls John Eckendorf, who has been Jim's co-writer since 1989. That 10-minute delay might be annoying if you're calling in a trivia answer, but local officials worried more about the potential for 10-minute delays on 911 calls and other emergencies. The contest forced AT&T to update the phone equipment with new digital technology about a decade ahead of schedule. Despite all the hoopla, I have a confession to make. As Earl and I head to our hotel to drop off our bags, and as I watch the parade later, I'm skeptical. I have a problem with the Stevens Point format. In my head, I'm putting air quotes around the word trivia every time I see or hear it. Because to me, this isn't trivia. I've always associated trivia with the unexpected joy, the epiphany, the ego stroke of mentally dredging up answers you didn't even know you knew. But Stevens Point players aren't standing on a stage holding buzzers. There's one thing wrong with a contest where the players are sitting at home with seven minutes to come up with each answer, and you've probably spotted it already. Google. <laughs> so that's how Google first enters into, uh, enters into the book. And, uh, and that's one of several trivia contests you go to. Uh, you go incognito to a trivia contest in Boston, right? Yeah, I have to wear a, a Red Sox cap down low over my head so nobody's like, hey, they've got that guy from Jeopardy on their team. You know, get him. <laughs> so, uh, so I was in disguise. And you talked to some other uh, trivia mavens. I know Fred Wirth is an old 1970s trivia author you talked to. And uh, you cover Trivial Pursuit in there. And it's, it's a great read. I, I had the chance to read it last week, and I recommend it. Well, thank you so much, Fritz. Yeah. Well, thanks Great for being time. here. Uh, questions? Start right here. Okay. Yeah, I know this story because I read on your blog, but I have to ask. Can you tell the story of the giant styrofoam head? <laughs> the giant styrofoam head? Uh, okay, for a while, I had a giant styrofoam head of, like, of my, my own head sitting in my garage. It's like about the size of a small car or something, you know? It's about the size of a VW Beetle. And uh, I guess a local parade in Utah had wanted to have floats about local celebrities. And so there's this huge Ken Jennings head driving through uh, downtown Draper, Utah, or whatever, on the 4th of July. And so <laughs> it doesn't look unlike me. There's a certain angle where it sort of looks like me. Um, it looked nothing From like me, I thought. Yeah, the back. <laughs> From the top. On Google Earth, it looks just like me, actually. Uh, but, uh, but after the parade, they called me, and they're like, so do you want a, a styrofoam version of your head? <laughs> And you don't say no to that question, but you know, it's not like I was waiting for that call. So you know, I didn't know what to do with it. You know, do you charge admission? Do you put a Santa hat on it and put it on your roof every year? I mean, what do you do with a styrofoam model of your head the size of a car? So they brought it over to my house and left it. And when we moved from Salt Lake to Seattle, I didn't know what to do with it. Because I, I didn't want to throw it away, you know? And you know, what do you do? Do you do some cathartic thing? Do you take a chainsaw to it? Do you put a cherry bomb in it? I mean, is that weird? Am I going to, am I going to be telling my analyst about that That's in 10 years? Voodoo, yeah. yeah. So I finally just put it on uh, eBay for charity, like to see if anybody would buy a, you know, Ken Jennings head the size of a car. And yeah, like the bidding got up to like $210. Um, I think Woot.com bought it. You guys ever look at Woot? 
I think uh, I think the That's Ken I think the Ken head is going to show up in a big bag. Oh crap! Uh, from, from Woot one oh, of these that's days. That's fantastic. <laughs> I hope so yeah, so. I am now head free. <laughs> Has anybody here uh, been on Jeopardy or tried out for Jeopardy? By the way, have we got any? Uh, uh, back? That's right. Three, times. Three times, right? Three, yeah. Congratulations. That's not easy to do. Well done. That's the guy. Uh, okay, more questions I see back here. I'm supposed to repeat the questions. I just wanted to know what you thought of uh, some of the sort of traditional game show world. What do you think of shows like uh, Do or Know Tell Me? And just like uh, like Shelby Down. As, as uh, someone who's uh, big in the game show world, what do you think about Deal or No Deal or uh, games that maybe are dumbing down the game show? Uh, deal or No Deal is funny to me because it's like, it's like the anti game show. It's like the bizarro world game show. Like, what if game shows require no skill whatsoever? It's like, <laughs> Great, that's what we want to air. You know, let's let's green light that. <laughs> and, you know, and I've seen the show, and it, it, I can see the appeal of it. You know, you you can sort of see it's very well structured. But still, to me, like, it sort of insults me that you would call that a game show. You know, it's it's like playing Candyland with your mom. You know, there's there's, there's no element of skill whatsoever. You know, it's just that the models are prettier than um, you know Baron Gumdrop or, or you know whatever the Candyland, uh, whoever the denizens of Candyland are. That's not necessarily a new thing, though, game shows that maybe don't require. In fact, that one reminds me of Treasure Hunt. If you ever right, saw it's a, Treasure Hunt in, like, the 70s. It's uh, essentially Treasure Hunt. And it's, you know, there's still um, part of the, you know, there's no play along to it, you know. You're not yelling out answers at your screen, like, pick 28, pick 28, or whatever. But you are, uh, you know, you are seeing normal people, you know, flirting with life-changing amounts of money. And that's sort of fun on its own, I guess. In Jeopardy, they emphasize, uh, the, the, at least in the tryouts, the play along aspect that, it's not, you know, it's all about you, but it's really about all these people at home. They're going to play along, right. and they want to enjoy playing along. They need to have time to answer the questions and everything. So, right. Uh, you're right, that one. I guess that one you can, you can sit at home and say, do it or don't do it. Take it. That's take true. It or don't take That's it. true. I guess there is some play along. Yeah. Uh, right back there? What kind of preparation did you go through for, for Jeopardy? There's a chapter in Brainiac which is pretty much, uh, I wouldn't call it how-to, because it sort of reads like some uh, crazy Unabomber style thing of you know, me, me letting Jeopardy rule my life for, you know, in the three weeks leading up to being on the show. But I did plenty of stupid stuff. I used to watch the show standing up behind my lazy boy at home, you know, pretending it was a, a contestant podium, and uh, you know, snatching from my toddler one of these Fisher-Price ring stacking toys and pulling off the donuts and using that for a, you know, a pretend buzzer. <laughs> <laughs> you know, trying to, trying to figure out the timing. And also, like you say, studying the stuff that always comes up on the show. You know, my wife and I made flashcards of world capitals and presidents. Um, I don't drink. Like, I'm a Mormon teetotaler, so also the potent potables. We had, you know, on the front, it's like, you know, Harvey Wallbanger. And on the back, it's like, you know, what is vodka, orange juice, and Galliano, you know? So, uh, so for, um, you know, for three weeks around our house, pretty much all we talked about was the presidency and cocktails. It was like, it was like... <laughs> It was like going to college with President Bush, you know? Uh, <laughs> it, was, it, it was very weird around our house for three weeks. <laughs> what, are your, uh, what are your bad categories? Um, a lot of them I learned on the show. Like, uh, country music kept coming up. Huh. Country music time and time again. I'd be like, my gosh. I'm, I'm a little bit rock and roll, it turns out. Uh, <laughs> hockey, there was always hockey that I, was, I sucked at. And I knew I was pretty weak at like corporate America type stuff. Yeah. And then, so it's sort of fitting that that's how I lost huh. on the H&R Block question. Because I, uh, I, I knew I didn't know that kind of stuff. Next. Uh, what do you think of crosswords, and uh, what kind of a relationship did you develop with Alex Trebek uh, over the time you were on the show? Strictly platonic. I don't know. I don't, I don't, I don't know what you've heard, but uh, I'm actually a pretty big crossword fan. I used to time myself every day with the, uh, the New York Times crossword because it ran in my student newspaper. And I actually just, um, just this spring went to Stamford, Connecticut, where they have the big uh, crossword tournament every year. And I, I was supposed to give out the awards, but I asked if I could play as well, and they're like, I guess, okay. So I, yeah, I played and I actually won the, uh, I won the rookie division, so I had to give myself an award. It was, it was, very, it was very awkward. Um, but, but there definitely is big crossover between crossword people and trivia people, I think. A lot of the, uh, I say in the book that a lot of the people who used to write for Who Wants to Be a Millionaire were uh, crossword constructors. 
that's sort of how they paid the bills. Um, Alex Trebek, when I was on the show, I sort of thought maybe he didn't like me. He seemed a little chilly. I sort of wondered what I had done. You know, does he not like sharing the spotlight? But um, the story I tell at the end of the book is coming back. He comes back on stage after my last game, and he's in his shirt sleeves, which you never see. You never see Trebek without a jacket, and it's weird. Like, uh, it's like seeing your parents naked, seeing Alex in shirt sleeves, <laughs> because you've never seen him before. And he's like, uh, he's actually sort of uh, choked up. He's like. Well, Ken, we're going to miss you around here. And I, I was very touched, you know? I guess he did like me after all. He just sort of had to pretend to be strict and authoritative and, and stuff. But I, I, th I, think he, uh, I think he misses me. <laughs> uh, way in the back there. So the question is, uh, uh, daily doubles, you, uh, they read you the question, there's an amount of time there where you have to answer. Is that an arbitrary amount of time? Is there a set period of time? My uh, understanding is that um, there is a sound effect, right? Yeah, or is yeah. there? Maybe not on daily doubles. No. I think on that, he just comes in and says, I'm I, sorry. I think it's pretty much all him. Like, I think, and I think it's sort of up to him, which is weird, because like, the whole game can hinge on it. And it's just Alex being like, hey, on the end, you're sort of cute. You, know, you, get, you get 20 <laughs> seconds on this daily double, ma'am, or, or whatever. But um, I don't remember that particular time. I do remember one case where he let me go a long time. Like, uh, like I sort of start going, who <laughs> is? And I think if you time it, it's like 25 seconds or something, you know? <laughs> Which is unreal. In, you know, in Jeopardy seconds, that's an eternity. Yeah. So yeah, I think that's pretty much host discretion. The real gap is like five seconds on a regular question, I think. Yeah. And, I, and I think it's sort of, sp I'm guessing it's sort of supposed to be the same thing, but, but then he has discretion I to think like, he sort of wings it, yeah. like widen the strike zone. Uh, sure, Hannah. So, obviously a lot of your high scores came from just answering a lot of questions right, but you were clearly using some sort of really raw secret betting strategy <laughs> far ahead. Um, can you talk a little bit about what you were doing and whether you were applying any sort of game theory in your case for game? Can you uh, talk about your betting strategy and if you applied uh, game theory? Jeopardy's been pretty extensively analyzed. Like, there's PhD dissertations on how to bet on Jeopardy. And, um, <laughs> It, because it turns out it's, it's sort of counterintuitive. Like, for example, if you're in second place, as you well know, if you're in second place going into the final, you should bet almost nothing. You know, you should not think, I'm behind, got to bet it all. You got you to wager almost nothing and hope that both you and the leader get it wrong. Um, because he or she should probably bet the whole thing, or close to it. Um, but, uh, like, in, in many of my games, the strategy didn't seem to matter that much. I mean, that's, that's the cool thing about locking up 65 of your games before the final question. You know, strategy is sort of irrelevant. On daily doubles, um, you often try to make a better situation for yourself by, um, you know, not losing the lock if you have one, or not losing a two-thirds situation where, I can't believe I'm getting into this. You, you, could, you should probably all go back to work. Like, you want, you, you want to keep, like, some two-thirds scenario where you do not go uh, below two-thirds of the leader, and you, or you, you do not lose that advantage over the second-place player, because that affects final jeopardy betting. So you want to bet in such a way that you can move yourself up a, up a, a, a ranking in how, you're, in how the scores wind up without dropping one if you get it wrong. But it's, a, it's pretty inexact science. If you feel good about the category, you know, if it's Academy Award winners, I bet 14,000 and I don't regret it, damn it. I mean, that was, that was the day I passed the all-time Jeopardy record. But ordinarily, you don't want to do that kind of stuff, you know. Um, I think you should always bet less than you think. That's sort of my... You were kind of aggressive or known for being kind of aggressive in Daily Double, so is that right? Depending on the category, yeah. But it, it lost me my last game. I mean, everybody talks about H&R Block, but it's like, uh, you know, Bill Buckner was just the second out. Or, 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 or I, guess, I guess it's the pitcher's fault for the unearned guys that were on base when Bill Buckner lets the grounder go through, you know? It was actually the two daily doubles I got wrong in that game that, that sort of hosed me. Opened the door. Huh? Yeah, and I bet too much on both of them. Sir. Did you get that bored during your run? It's sort of an interesting psychological test. Like, you know, can the most interesting, rewarding thing on the planet become boring for this little lab rat if you shock him enough times, you know? And uh, it's true, you know, you know, Jeopardy just zaps the pleasure center. It's so much fun. It's high stakes game against very smart people. You're making maybe uh, $68,000 an hour. That's a pretty good hourly rate. I mean, <laughs> even, even at Google, I would assume. Um, 
so you know, it should be the funnest thing imaginable. But yeah, if you do it for a whole summer, you know, if it becomes an effective summer job, you do sort of start to think, well, frankly, this was more fun in April, you know? Uh, <laughs> and uh, towards the end, I did sort of start to think, you know, when do you, uh, when do you throw one? Um, I, th I think I would have lost my 100th game. Luckily, I arranged to lose my 75th game, you know, without, <laughs> without really meaning to. But I think I would have thrown the 100th game in Final Jeopardy, you know. The Final Jeopardy answer would have been, what is, I'm out of here, you know. <laughs> <laughs> what about uh, the people you were on the show with? Uh, obviously, after some time, you had some notoriety and uh, people would come in. Uh, what was that like? What were the contestants like with you before? before? It would just break my heart. I mean, people are nice, but, I mean, it was their lifelong dream to be on Jeopardy, too, same as me. Except I'm ruining it for uh, like 100 and, 149 of them, I guess. Um, so yeah, I've never really ruined 149 lifelong dreams in a row like that. Uh, it didn't keep you from winning 74 games. No, I mean, obvious, obviously this guilt did not uh, make me throw a game, but, uh, but I, I felt bad about it in a you know, hypothetical sense. Hypothetical, yeah. Right. Can you talk about the middle part of the game? Yeah, but yeah, knowing the answer is pretty small. Well, I don't know if it's small. But it's, uh, it's a part of Jeopardy that all three contestants share equally. So there's a lot of other aspects to it. Yeah, mentally, I mean, there's fatigue. I mean, if your plan is to win 75 games, <laughs> you're going to be playing 10 shows every 48 hours. Um, and you, you know, your feet hurt, your brain hurts. So there is that, you know, trying to make it a marathon and not a sprint. Um, there's very few head games. I remember a few contestants trying to you know, psych me out backstage or something. But there's very, there's very little of that. It's, it's very collegial. They sort, of, they sort of fool you into forgetting the game theory and thinking that, you know, we're all in this together, which is, it couldn't be further from the truth, you know. <laughs> Jeopardy's a zero-sum game. But, um, but uh, yeah, mental mistakes, fatigue, you know. I, I don't remember getting cocky. I mean, I guess I did start to bid too much. I guess you could say I lost that last game because I, you know, I started bidding too much. Did you uh, eat differently? Did you like carbo-load uh, the nights before? You the like Jeopardy that? diet. Yeah. It's, it's going to be my second Or what about, one. did you have like a lucky breakfast or anything like that? You ate every... Uh... Uh, I usually ate the same stuff backstage on Jeopardy. I usually ate all the pineapple off the tray. And I don't, uh, that's not like a baseball player superstition, like not changing your jock or whatever, but uh, <laughs> it was more like I just like pineapple. But, but I did sort of get into these routines, you know, without really meaning to, like, uh, like writing my name differently on the podium every show. That was just an accidental routine that I... You know, I felt like I shouldn't switch. I, yeah, yeah. I'm not superstitious, but I hear that superstitions can get you whether you believe in them or not. So. <laughs> <laughs> yes. What's the uh, lag time uh, between when a show tapes and when it airs, and and how did that have an effect on the on the game itself as you were playing? When I was on, it was usually four months. So, 48 shows have taped before any of them air. And before then, it would, it would be even more heartbreaking because everybody would come in bright-eyed and bushy-tailed, and then one of the contestant people would have to be like, uh, this guy has won 36 games or whatever. And you could just see their faces fall. Um, <laughs> at, at, least, uh, at least when the shows had started to air, you know, there was more like, oh, he's still here, you know? Like, <laughs> you walk into the room and you're immediately hated. And, you know, many... And frankly, many trivia nerds know that feeling anyway, but uh, <laughs> it was especially pronounced backstage on, uh, on Jeopardy. Yes? So after four months, how did you reveal to your family and coworkers that you were on Jeopardy and how they reacted? So uh, after four months, how did you reveal to your, your family and friends that you were on the show and, uh, and how did they react? They found out pretty much the same way everybody else did. They just started watching it every night, you know? You know, and, uh, you know and I'd feel bad because they'd be so tense, like, is this going to be the night he loses? Because they're thinking, okay, three games tops, you know. Is this going to be the night he loses? And I don't want to tell him, you know. You can, you can chill out there, Dad. Uh, it's going to be okay. And, uh, <laughs> um, they. Uh, did you did you tell them when you went down and tried out and you got on the show? Did you call your family I friends I told them and say, I was gonna I'm going to be, be on. on the show? Yeah. I told them I was going to be on. I just didn't tell them if I had won or lost that first game. And so, by extension, every following game. Right, I see. Um, and, you know, I, they would have had every right to be mad. And I sort of wondered, are they going to be mad? But, I mean, I think uh, my parents were just busting buttons. You know, they were so uh, proud and annoying all their friends with the news that they, uh, they didn't have any time <laughs> to be mad at me for keeping them in the dark for four months. Huh. Yes? How do you uh, reconcile the, the fact-based uh, 
fame career you have on with your uh, spir spirituality, with your religion. Right. I'm, I'm, I'm devoutly church-going uh, Mormon. Um, and uh, I, I assume there's some stereotype that, uh, well, you know, how could, a, how could somebody religious go on Jeopardy? They're going to get all the evolution questions wrong or, or whatever, you know? <laughs> uh, what is there were no dinosaurs, Alex? Uh, <laughs> I, I, I refuse to answer this. That's, uh, when you say Pleistocene, you mean Tuesday, right? You know? <laughs> but... Uh, I don't know. I think uh, I, th I would actually say my religious upbringing actually. Um, I think intelligence and, uh, is actually sort of valued in. Uh, first of all, I mean, first of all, the general stereotype about religious people being, you know, sort of uh, the, the general media stereotype belief for religious people being hopeless mouth breathers. I, I don't think it's totally true. I mean, I'm, I'm sure. I assume there's very smart people who uh, who are religious t to one degree or another. And you know, in particular, my Mormon faith. I think in, in, within the LDS community, intelligence is sort of prized. There's the idea that. Um, you know, you can't take it with you unless it's intelligence, you know. The stuff you learn is like, assuming there's an afterlife, it's probably the one thing that's going to go with you, you know. So we should value that above, you know, the car you drive or, or whatever. And, uh, and so I think that sort of stayed with me during my life. I think that's a big part of what made me who I am. Huh. Great answer. Uh, yes, way in the back there. What do you think of the change of rules uh, to allow people to play more than five games? Totally against it. <laughs> <laughs> that sucks. I need to go back to work and start unit testing this thing I did three years ago. Um, I actually had, like, if I was not the guy, I think I'd be against it, um, just because of the risk of that happening a lot. Because I think, you know, one time it's funny if some guy's on show, the show for six months. But, you know, like many things, that's not so funny if it happens all the time. And... Uh, you know, this guy has some unfair advantage, this, or, or woman, you know, this player has an unfair advantage over everybody else. There's an incredible home court advantage to that uh, left-hand podium, you know, the, the, the buzzer skills you got and the, you know, the inner calm you probably have compared to the other two and the intimidation factor. Um, so there is, there is the potential for that to be trouble for Jeopardy, I think. Um, but that said, it's about my favorite Jeopardy rule. <laughs> <laughs> All right, until we got time for one more question, who's got a great one? No, you're down in front. Front counts for great. So I'm wondering if your family and friends sort of went through phases of, hey, you can't go on Jeopardy, oh, you're still on Jeopardy. <laughs> Hang on, how many did you want now? Did, did the reactions change? How did they change over time? Did your family get bored with you? Is that, <laughs> is that what you're asking? <laughs> it's like the six stages of grieving or whatever. The six stages of Jeopardy. Um, yeah, there's definitely a sense in which, you know, it's, it's funny just how the, the weirdest thing imaginable can just be normalized so quickly, you know. At, at first, you know, every night it was on, my sister would come over to my house to watch, you know. Like, okay, we're, we're going to be there at 6.30, you know, she's so excited. And uh, it took about a week for her to be like, yeah, um, we'll just watch it at home tonight, you know. <laughs> <laughs> and when I say watch it at home, I mean watch 24, you know. <laughs> So yeah, they, they, I think they very quickly just got used to the new uh, status quo. Huh. All right, uh, I think that uh, that almost concludes uh, today's presentation. Ken's going to sign a few books, if you're willing, I'd love afterwards. To. And again, if you're in San Francisco he, and want even more Ken Jennings, <laughs> he is going to be at a book passage at the Ferry Building. Is that right? Yeah. Ferry Building in uh, San Francisco at 7 o'clock tonight doing a reading and uh, meet and greet. Thank you all for coming, and uh, about a hand. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Awesome. That was great. That was a fun one.